Kicking things off, we have Kayla Zohowski, who is talking about bingos, phonies, and triple triples, learning to babble the dabble of competitive Scrabble. Whoa. We also have Rich Reddy, who's talking about Space World, a total entertainment and awareness experience for the entire family. And then we're finishing off with Amir, B Amir Bagdashi, who's saying, you say potato, the great hash browns versus home fries debate, and what it tells us about America. Oh, boy. But we're going to start out with our dear friend, my dear friend, and soon to be yours, Kayla Zahowski, who is going to tell us about Scrabble. Kayla is a biologist, and in fact, you may recognize her from other Nerd Night talks, but tonight she's not talking about biology, she's talking about competitive Scrabble. So I'm gonna hand this off to her. Please join me in welcoming Kayla. All right, hello everybody. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, is it anybody's first time at a nerd night? Lots of hands. Well, welcome because Nerd Night at Top of the Park, it's actually my first time at Nerd Night at Top of the Park. Um, and so this is gonna be an amazing experience. Um, as Emily mentioned, my name is Kayla. I am a scientist. I have presented on several scientific topics ranging from viruses to Louis Pasteur to DNA and ancestry. But today, I am so excited to talk to you about a passion of mine that does not have to do with science, and that is competitive Scrabble. Now, uh, if it's a surprise to you that there is a group of people that play competitive, play Scrabble competitively, maybe, you know, sit inside a room for eight hours playing seven to eight games of Scrabble nonstop and still want to play more, well, you're not alone. This actually takes a lot of people by surprise. But I'm hoping by the end of the talk today, you'll have a better idea just about the game of Scrabble in general, but also about what it takes to play this game competitively. So, you know, when we think about Scrabble, we're thinking about tiles, we're thinking about letters, we're thinking about anagrams. I mean, who's played the game of Scrabble? All right, I actually, uh, there's some hands that are down, so uh, you need to get a Scrabble game stat and play. It's gonna be amazing. Um, but, you know, there's a lot more to Scrabble than just anagrams, and that's what we're gonna go through today. I have this talk divided into three sections. We're gonna talk about the history, we're gonna talk about the dictionary, and then we're gonna talk about strategy, the thing that Scrabble players are the most passionate about. So let's go ahead and get started. Scrabble actually starts off with this man named Alfred Butts. He was an architect um, in the Great Depression, and he was really a fan of games, and he thought about games in a couple categories. One is chance, one is skill, and then he thought, well, what game could I make that would be a combination of chance and skill? And this desire to have a combo is what really led for the idea of Scrabble to be born. Now, Alfred Butts was a avid reader of the New York Times, and so he would actually pour over the front page of the New York Times to be able to get an idea about what is language, you know, what is the probability of letters, how often does a letter appear, and, you know, if, if I know how often that letter appears and what types of words it appears in, maybe that helps me uh, craft a letter distribution as well as the value of those letters to make a game, and so that's what he did. Now, I've got a trivia question for you. Um, what year was Scrabble invented by Mr. Butts? Okay, I'm hearing some 30s, I'm hearing some 50s. I guess I gave the it away when I said uh, Depression Era, and actually that New York Times screenshot, which none of you can see, is from the year that uh, <laughs> the game was invented. We're looking at 1938. So let's all say that every Scrabble player here, 2038, we're gonna be psyched to celebrate 100 years of Scrabble. Um, second trivia question, which of these names was first pitched as the first name of Scrabble? We've got Lexico or crisscross words. I'll take a poll. Who thinks it was Lexico? All right, who thinks it was crisscross words? Oh, we've got like an even split and I'm happy about that because this is a trick question. They both were. 
I mean, I like both of these. <laughs> but, you know, Scrabble, of course, would be, would be my top choice. So I'm glad we ended up with that. All right, so you know, thinking about how Scrabble came from Mr. Butts to the game that it is today, um, I don't know anything about this company, but apparently this company bought the rights to Scrabble in 1972. Oh, I was doing a little bit of reading, and I figured out that this company also did Parcheesi, OK? But let's look at this logo, folks. What other game do we think that they were? Yeah, Trivial Pursuit. I'm like, they did a great job. It's right there in their advertising. So Trivial Pursuit, that's something I learned. Um, but over the course of Scrabble's history as a commercial product, there's been a lot of things that have happened. Um, actually, in 1989, Hasbro bought the rights to Scrabble. But then there was this huge uh, US versus the rest of the world license battle. Um, we won't get into it. It could be really interesting for another you know, uh, economical talk. But if you go anywhere else outside of the US or Canada, Mattel owns Scrabble. So um, that's interesting. But you know, we don't really care about Scrabble as this entity or who's producing it. What we care about is competition. So Selchow and Ryder in the center here actually were responsible for creating Scrabble tournaments. And so they helped create the National Scrabble Association, 1978. And this is when Scrabble tournaments really took off. They became really official. You got really into the ability to play Scrabble competitively, have a rating, have this entire community where you're doing Scrabble in this competitive environment. Now, competitive Scrabble has its own convoluted history. Um, but let's just say that uh, if we jump forward in time, in 2009, we changed into something called the National, or, sorry, National, North American Scrabble Players Association. So if you're playing Scrabble competitively today here in Ann Arbor, we're following NASPA. All right, so now you have an idea about the history. Let's move into the dictionary, one of the most important pieces of Scrabble. So when we say dictionary, you're like, OK, we've got Merriam-Webster. We know some words. Um, this is not the right dictionary. But OK, we've got the Scrabble dictionary, right? Hosted by Merriam-Webster. Also not the right dictionary. Uh, if you go anywhere else outside of the US, you're looking at the Collins Dictionary has a lot of European words, not the right dictionary. What we're using is the NASPA Dictionary, North American Scrabble Player Association. They have their own dictionary for competitive Scrabble. Why not? <laughs> so um, this Scrabble dictionary gets updated maybe every three or five years. New words get added. There's a whole committee involved in deciding which words get added to the latest version of the Scrabble dictionary. Now, you might be thinking, OK, why is the dictionary so important? If you're asking that, you've never played a game of Scrabble. Because you know that if you play a word that is not in the dictionary, your opponent can challenge you and that word gets taken off the board and you lose your turn. And if you didn't know that, well, maybe you have some like house rules that are really a lot more lenient <laughs> than what you should be playing by. OK, so dictionaries. So what I have here is an actual distribution of the words that are in the NASPA dictionary. Again, we're talking NASPA here. And um, you can see we go from 2 to 15. We max out at 15, because that's the maximum number of letters that you can play on a uh, Scrabble board. So we don't care about anything longer than that. Now, what you also see here is there is 107 two-letter words. Now, two-letter words, anybody have opinions? <laughs> I hear some boos, and that's what I'm expecting. So the infamous two-letter words. Um, this is the list of them. There's a lot. Uh, if, you <laughs> if you play competitively, this is an absolute must to know. And the reason is, is because it really helps you out in the strategy portion. And I'll show you that later when we get to that section. Now, if be from the booze, I'm guessing that if you have a, the, one of these two-letter words played on you, you're like, OK, but what does that mean? Because we're all about, you have to know the definition. So let's learn a few. All right, AA. What? Oh, OK, all right. We're getting into uh, acronyms over here, which are not acceptable. Um, so AA actually is a word for a type of lava. Why not? All right, what about ZA? Anybody? 
pizza. Yeah, so you can confidently play za. And when someone's like, well, what does that mean? You're like, pizza. Maybe we should grab a slice after I destroy you. Some other infamous words on this list. QI is, of course, a, a really great one if you have the Q. This is just like chi, like, you know, like centering your chi. And then, interestingly, KI means the exact same thing. So now you can play those words, and when someone challenges you, you know what they mean. But of course, in Scrabble, we don't really care about definitions. We just care whether or not they're a real word and you can play them. But let's go over a few other words that I think are fun. So CWM, we're going to do a, a gladiator, you know, thumbs, thumbs up if you think it's a word, thumbs down if you think it's not a word. OK, all right. Well, if you were in the gladiator rank, this word would perish. But this is actually a word. This is a valid word in Scrabble. It has some meaning like the entry to a valley, and I think it's Welsh. But you can play it, and that's great if you don't have any vowels. All right, OMG. All right, all right, you guys are good. All right, this is, this is not in the dictionary yet. Maybe one day they'll add it, but at least right now it's not, it's not, it's a acronym, it doesn't count. What about PWN? Okay, all right, maybe we have some gamers in the crowd. Uh, this is actually a new word that was recently added, and it means like, like you pwn somebody, like you own them or you destroy them, specifically most commonly in video games. So these are you know, the words that you have to know if you're playing Scrabble. All right, these words are you know, unique, but let's say you get to ones that are a little bit trickier. You know, it's not obvious if they're words or not. Uh, beefier, yay, nay. Yeah, you guys got it. Of course, you could be beefier than somebody else, but you could also be use those letters to play freebie. So the beauty of anagrams here. What about bookier? All right, OK. I mean, I was thinking like if you're more bookish, you could be bookier than somebody. But no, that's not true. This is not good. But you could play brookie, which apparently is a type of trout. What about bonnier? OK, OK, yeah, we got one thumbs up. I'm sorry, I don't know what you think this means. But yeah, this is not, <laughs> this is not a word. But you could play webinar. And then boozier. Oh, yeah, of course. We all want our cocktails to be boozier than our neighbors. This is a valid word. So just to give you a flavor of uh, some of the words that you might encounter. Now, um, thinking about, again, di the dictionary, I mentioned that it's updated at some regular intervals. This is important because sometimes words that are kind of feel like common vernacular actually aren't valid in Scrabble. And the example I like to give is like text, text, text it or texting. Maybe you're maybe it's 2010 and you know you just texted your friend that you were entering a Scrabble tournament. And so you get these letters and you're like, yeah, I just texted my friend that I'm entering the Scrabble tournament. Well, actually at that time, that word would have been invalid in Scrabble. It had not been adopted into the dictionary. So even though we were using text as a verb, at that time, text was just a noun. All right, so what are some other ver or words that have been added recently? We're actually in a transition phase. So a new dictionary was just released and valid in Scrabble tournaments in February. And here's just a flavor of some of the words that they chose to add. Bay, adorb, swole, folk, squawk. Oh, sorry. Oh, I don't know what happened here. Uh, there were supposed to be some more words here, and one of them was Grawlix, G-R-A-W-L-I-X. And that was the only one where I'm like, what is, I, I must be out of touch with reality. I'm like, what is Grawlix? And apparently, Grawlix is the, when you have like a speech bubble that's just made out of characters. So I learned something new. And then the other one that was down here was Zonky. And uh, I guess you could think you could figure out what it is, but I'd never seen a picture of one. And so here's a cute zonkey. Next time you have a Z, a K, and a Y on your rack, which is improbable. <laughs> All right, so you're like, okay, Kayla, I got the dictionary down. I play things like words with friends. Anybody? Okay, okay. I play Wordle. I play spelling bee. Yeah, you're like, I've got the dictionary down. I'm going to know these words. No, you won't. 
these games do not use the NASPA Scrabble dictionary. So you're studying, you're encountering words in these other games, and they may or they may not be valid in Scrabble. Do you want to get yourself confused? No, you do not. You might feel frustrated and say, oh, this Grawlix of a reaction is what I'm feeling. Um, so unfortunately, these games are just confusing you. Um, I will say, speaking of Grawlix and words that might be inserted here, if you're interested after Nerd Night tonight, come talk to me about the biggest hashtag Scrabble drama event that has ever happened in competitive Scrabble. Very polarizing, has to do with the dictionary, not words that were added, words that were moved. Let's talk about it, it's very dramatic. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to our third category, strategy. We're getting into the good stuff. So if you're a casual player, you're playing at home. All right, two to four players, seven tiles per rack. These are some of the rules. You add, you build on existing words. You only place vertical, horizontal. This is just how you play Scrabble. You know, maybe your father rage quits when you play QI. Um, this is how casual works. When you move into competitive, things are a little bit different. So one, two players only, none of this four player stuff. Uh, you have 25 minutes per side, so you have a timer. You're using kind of like chess, you have 25 minutes. If you go over that, you start deducting points. You also have a special rotating board. I've got one up here if you want to look. You've got to be able to rotate it because no one has to play upside down in competitive. This is a competition. No one's going to be at a disadvantage. You also have special tiles. You don't use the tiles that come with a Scrabble set because you could reach your grubby little paws in and start feeling around for the letter. Those are engraved. You could pick out the letter you want. Instead, we have special tiles that are smooth on one face, hollow on the other side, so that way you can pick it up and know how to set it down so your opponent doesn't see it. Another thing you're doing is you're holding your Scrabble bag above eyesight. When you reach in, you got to tell your opponent, I'm not trying to peek in and look for the right letters. Always got to be above your eyes. A lot of these, you know, small little rules <laughs> to prove you're not cheating in Scrabble, I guess. Um, and then, of course, there's a rating. You're playing tournaments. You want to up this rating. It follows ELO, same thing as chess. And when you play a tournament, you can either gain or lose this precious, precious rating depending on how you do. And remember, this is a game of chance and skill, but also chance. So let's learn about some of the important things in Scrabble. Number one, the bingo. You play all seven letters on your rack, you're getting an extra 50 points. Now, this is pretty huge for your score. This is highly coveted. Let's say you have retinas. Is that seven points? No, that's 57 points. Let's say after the second talk at Nerd Night, you're inspired to play monorail. Is that 10 points? Nope, you got 60. And then finally, maybe you've got a nice, some nice high scoring letters. You get something like zooming. You're not getting 19 points, you're getting up to 69. So bingos are the thing that you want to improve your score. Now, thinking about bingos, I mean, these, maybe you'd see them if they were on your rack. But remember, there's a lot of these words where we don't know the definition of them. We probably don't even recognize that they're words. So what do you do there? Well, you study. You study stems. And what I mean by stem is you have six high probability tiles plus another letter gives you a bingo. Now, there's lots of ways that you can study this. Some of the group uses flashcards. Um, a more old school way is to use mnemonics. Um, I actually learned a few via mnemonics, so I'm going to put up one of my favorites. We have retain. Our mnemonic is smug wife keeps the children. What does that mean? Nothing. But every letter in smug wife keeps the children combined with retain gives you a bingo. Uh, just to give you a little sneak peek at that, this is actually not all of the bingos you can make. This is just one example per letter. So what you do is you end up learning, okay, smug wife keeps the children, retain, and you memorize all of the combinations of bingos that you could possibly get. Because again, those 50 points are going to be really helpful. Now let's say that maybe you're not really that great at studying or like uh, memorizing words. What you can do is you could play a phony. Now, a phony is a word that is not good in Scrabble, but you play it. Remember, we went back to why the dictionary is important? is because your opponent can challenge that word, and then you take it off and you lose your turn. 
Or your opponent could be like, that does sound like a word. And they leave it, and you get the 50 free points. Now, I'll give you an example. I recently played the word siren in a tournament. I legitimately thought siren was going to be a word. Like, the ambulance siren by. So I played this word thinking it was great. Does my opponent challenge? No. They were like, yeah, of course siren is a word. So did I feel bad about it after I learned the truth? I did. But, you know, some people play phonies and they don't feel bad about them, and that is a valid Scrabble strategy. It's all about the mind games here. Other words you might play, oh, sorry, does your opponent challenge? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Other words that you might play that you think are good but are not, or you know are bad but you might get away with, Zamboni, not a real word. Maybe after the third talk today at Nerd Night, you're inspired to play Hash Brown, not a valid word in Scrabble. Do you think your opponent's going to challenge that? Probably not, because everyone loves hash browns. All right, so in addition to a phony, the next piece of strategy is board vision. So here's the Scrabble board. And you can't really see the words here, but each of these colored tiles gives you some bonus. Maybe it's a double letter. Maybe it's a triple letter. Maybe it's a double word. Or the coveted triple word. So board vision is really about not only knowing what your tiles are, but also where you should play it. And I'll give you one example. So here we have, let's say someone played ban, B-A-N, and then you have the letters A-X-E. And you play it here. It's always a good idea to double up and scrabble, create two words if you can, so you make bane and axe. All right, not a bad play. I mean, the X is eight points on its own. You get 16 points from this. Maybe you're thinking, that's not too bad. But if you have board vision, what are we seeing? We are seeing that there is a double letter score here. Our x is 8. If we put it there and we know our two-letter words, we can also play ax here, create three two-letter words, play the same letters, get the double letter score on the x going both ways. How many points do we get? 42. The answer to life, the universe, and everything here with the same exact letters just played in a different spot. So this is board vision, and this is what Scrabble players love. It's not about finding the word on your rack. It's about finding the best word on the board given the landscape. It's like a puzzle. All right, so in addition to board vision, you know, I talked about this coveted triple word. The most coveted beyond that is a triple triple. Not only are you hitting one triple word, but you're hitting two triple words in one play. Now, if you're looking up here and you're kind of counting, it is eight total tiles. So you have to have one tile in the middle there in order to be able to hit it. All right, triple, triple word. Uh, this doesn't happen a lot for players like me, because even though I'm up here talking, I am actually very mediocre. Um, but for top ranked players, this happens you know, more frequently. But I want to give you a taste of what the most uh, scored play ever in a Scrabble tournament was. And that is, sorry, you can't probably see it, but that's playing Quixotry here. So there was a letter hanging off. They got the Q. They got the X. They got the Y. They hit both triple triples. How many points is this going to be? Let's, let's, <laughs> did someone say 82? All right, let's do this math. We've got the letters that you score from the word, 35, and then you triple it. All right, 105, and then you triple it. 315, is that all you get? Absolutely not. It's also a bingo. Add those 50 points. 365 points in one play. That is the beauty of the triple triple. I mean, again, this is like the highest scoring play that's ever been made. But the beauty of the triple triple, this score is sometimes higher than I ever get in an entire game. So, you know, hashtag quick satry goals. All right, so I've talked a lot about um, Scrabble history. Uh, and what I want to say next is that there's actually a lot of local history here as well. So Michigan specifically, but also Ann Arbor, has a amazing history of, um, of really phenomenal Scrabble players uh, historically and present day. Um, I have this picture of an, of an article from, sorry, you can't see it, but this actually is the Celine Reporter. And this is an article from 1991. And this is highlighting a local legend, Chuck Armstrong, who uh, 
played in this tournament, but if you read the fine print, also in 1991 had the Guinness Book of World Record title as the most Scrabble tournaments won. <laughs> Very impressive. So not only was Chuck Armstrong incredibly uh, impressive in 1991, but he is still playing the, the Scrabble tournament circuit and still winning. And uh, he's the one that's getting all the triple triples uh, in Ann Arbor, folks. Um, but yes, of course, we have a Scrabble club. And uh, you know, Scrabble is a beautiful game. It's amazing, the strategy, the uh, anagram solving, the math, the puzzle. But we also have an even better community. So there's lots going on. You may not have known it, but there's lots going on with Scrabble here in Michigan. And we have such a great team. And if you're interested in Scrabble after this, feel free to come up and chat with me. Uh, and you can come and see what the local club is all about and maybe play a tournament. I don't know. You got to get those two letters word words down, though. Like, I'm not joking. So today we've talked about the history, the dictionary, and the strategy involved in Scrabble. Um, if you need more to state your Scrabble consumption, there's lots of other Scrabble stuff out there. It's not just me. We've got some novels. We've got some TV shows. We've got some amazing YouTube channels that have just great geeky Scrabble content. So you can Scrabble as much to your heart's content as you'd like. So I started talking about how you know Scrabble is tiles, anagram solving. Um, does anybody want to guess what this spells? You guys, see, you're all naturals. Do you want to play? All right, thank you so much to the Ann Arbor District Library for hosting us. Uh, it's an amazing, huh? yeah. It's an amazing event, and I'm so happy to be able to share Scrabble with you. I will say again, um, Scrabble Club, we play on Tuesday. This is not really like a come, I mean, please join our Scrabble Club if you want to, but it's just also like Scrabble is super fun and cool. And I think the strategy and like the math and the puzzle, you know, I'll stop now. Um, but I also want to give a shout out to uh, Chuck and I are both wearing our Kalamazoo Scrabble Fest shirts. Uh, the Kalamazoo Literacy Council actually does a fundraiser every year where you can play casual or competitive Scrabble. And it's a super fun event, super, like great for fundraising. And so again, a lot of Scrabble happening here in Michigan. And with that, I hope you're inspired. I will take questions. All right, I've got one down here. Oh my gosh, okay, he said, what is my best word I've ever played? I know exactly what it is because every, every Scrabble player knows exactly what it is. Um, I actually, I did get a triple-triple in a tournament and it was frigates. And I felt really bad because my opponent was uh, a lot younger than me and he challenged and I was just like, oh dang, you need, like, this is a real word. <laughs> So he challenged, he lost, uh, I got to go again, but yeah, it was triple, triple. I don't remember exact number of points, but it was like 150 or something. So I was pretty pleased. Oh yeah, we got one down here. How many letters does it take to make a triple? He said, uh, the question is how many letters does it take to make a triple, triple? Great question. So the triple triples are eight letters apart. So you need a minimum of eight letters. But if you have some letters in the middle and you're really, really clever, like Chuck Armstrong, then maybe it could be more. So eight minimum, but up to 14. <laughs> I know, it's, it's some pretty long words, yeah. Okay, one more, back here. Okay, uh, so, wait, I'm not sure I heard, was it at Greek letters? Why are you sometimes allowed to, okay, someone's gonna have to, so. Oh, sometimes allowed to use foreign words and sometimes not. Honestly, such a great question and one that makes it so confusing to be a competitive Scrabble player because it all goes into the committee that decided on what words were going to be added. So sometimes you get a word like EAU, water in French. Can you play it? Yes, you can. But uh, you didn't see it on the slide today. But actually, the word queso, cheese, was just added this year. And so how do you keep it track? Uh, you just, you have to just make space in your brain to remember it all. 
that's a big piece. All right, thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Kayla. Actually, I would like to amend that. I don't say thank you to Kayla, I say thanks. And I say it with an X, because I'm just gonna throw that in Mr. Butt's face. Yes, why not, more points. This was great, thank you so much. I laughed, I cried, I don't wanna play Scrabble. I am intimidated more than ever. <laughs> um, all right, uh, moving right along, folks. We are moving on to our next speaker, and that is going to be Rich Reddy. He is the communications and marketing manager at the Ann Arbor District Library. He knows all about Ann Arbor history, and if you don't believe me, you can read his book. It's called The Book of Ann Arbor, and I think it proves my point. Uh, you can also listen to the podcast that he created and that's hosted on AADL.org. It's called Ann Arbor stories and it's a delight so I highly recommend you check it out but don't take my word for it take the word of Rich Reddy who's gonna take us into the dream of the 1970s with Space World Rich Reddy hello all right quick quiz would you rather have a Buffalo Wild Wings or a roller coaster that is enclosed and when you get in it, it feels like you're moving at the speed of light? Okay, a Kia dealership or a series of monorails? Okay, a powerhouse gym or a refurbished after fire damage geodesic dome from the Montreal Expo of 1967? <laughs> Which one? You want, the, you want the dome, right? You don't want the Keelid. A Hampton Inn and Suites and Fairfield Inn and Suites or hotels that replicate living on a moon colony. Unfortunately, the good people of Ypsilanti Township back in the late 70s chose the former. So if you are near the Eagle Crest Golf Club out in Ipsy, Ipsy Township, you will see from this nice map all of those wonderful things. You can go to that B-dubs, you can go to that powerhouse gym, you can go to all those, but you can't go to is Space World. <laughs> Louder so they can hear it in Ipsy. <laughs> they said it was the biggest thing to hit Ypsilanti since the auto plants. Quote, this thing is gonna have an effect on residents in this township like nothing before. I say, we should have a public hearing about it. And soon, which is always, that's the best way to go about something is to have a public hearing about it. Tonight I'm gonna to talk to you about Space World. Chapter one, the Thomas Edison of clean rooms makes his fortune. Dr. Philip Robert Austin, he was born 1936, New Rochelle, New York, went to the University of Detroit, then got his PhD at Caltech in aeronautical engineering, went into the Air Force and worked on the F-105, which was one of the big fighters during the Vietnam era that had problems all the time. And so he was trying to solve these problems and that led to getting into something called clean room technology. Put up your hand if you know, this is a nerdy audience, what a clean room is. Yes, I'm not gonna tell you what a clean room is now. No, I will tell you just real quick. Clean rooms, they remove all the particles from a room so that you can do uh, very fancy stuff like pharma, like, uh, semiconductors, all of these really safe things. Uh, they take something like 350 million bad particles per cubic meter and can bring that down to 12. Each of you, if you're like relatively uh, well showered, are emitting right now 100,000 of those particles, 100,000. It takes it down to 12 so that you can do all this very important work. So in the Air Force, he made his mark being really great at this technology, and that led to him uh, being on some black projects with the US Air Force, and that was clean room technology. He helped with the Apollo program. He helped with a lot of shady military stuff. Um, and he literally wrote the book on clean rooms. It is called The Encyclopedia of Clean Rooms, Bio Clean Rooms, and Aspectic, I, di I didn't look that up, Areas. 
You can buy a copy right now on Amazon. It's 1,000 pages, 1,500 photos for $625. So Ipsy can hear it. No, so they also called him the Thomas Edison of clean rooms. This guy, clean room guy. What he decided to do was come to Livonia. That's where you go when you're that Thomas Edison of clean rooms. You move to Livonia and you start a business called Control Laboratories, Inc. Super cool. And what you do is you are training people now about clean rooms. You're visiting places to set up clean rooms. You are making bank as the clean room person. Should probably, I think I have a slide about clean rooms. There's the clean rooms. He is also super into roller coasters. Like really into, I'm not kidding. They, the MLive did a little story a year ago uh, where they interviewed some former coworkers and his son. And they were like, he didn't miss a ride. He just loved to go in clean rooms uh, and then go on roller coasters. It was great. This guy loved roller coasters. The combination of the two lead to chapter two, roller coasters and living on the moon. So history of theme parks a little real quick. We had pleasure gardens that turned into resort parks, that turned into picnic groves and trolley parks and amusement parks and then theme parks. Did you know Cedar Point back in the 70s? This is more than 100 years old back then. Now, when we're talking, which is about 1977, Disney World is only six years old. Still pretty new. Disneyland had been around for a while, but forget about that place. Orlando's where it was at. Six years old, and there was a little bit of a theme park boom was happening. People were really pretty interested in theme parks. So he was also obsessed with space. And this came from the Apollo work. This came from him writing a special uh, report for NASA about the feasibility of living on the moon. He put together this big proposal about how to live on the moon. So what he decided was, OK, roller coasters and space and have a lot of money burning a hole in my pocket. Why not do Disney World but space? themed. And so that's where he came up with Space World. Chapter three, Space World. Expectation. So he traveled around with his, this is an adorable photo somewhere, he traveled around with his kids all over the country to theme parks, visiting them, studying them, motorhomes, geodesic domes. He covered it all to learn as much as he could about the best possible places to, uh, the best possible features to have for a theme park based on space. They did a study on the US, 60 possible places, 60 in the country. Guess where they picked? Ypsilanti Township. That was the number one place to put a space themed, so they seemed a space themed place. Beaten out, put up your hand if you're from Romulus or Jackson or where else, Grand Blank or Pontiac. No, 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 no. Ipsy Township won out of all of those places. And so at the I-94 and Whitaker Road interchange, near the Buffalo Wild Wings and the Kia dealership and all of that, that was where they were gonna put Space World. I'm gonna run down, did you forget about the roller coasters that were enclosed to make you feel like your speed of light? Uh, did I talk about the simulating uh, zero gravity ride that was round and spun around and then the, the floor dropped out six years before the Gravitron was invented? Did I mention the Lunar Colony and the Lunar Hotel, the monorails? The oh, did I mention the theaters and pavilions or the future Earth area or for you super nerds, the Jules Verne area and then a replication life-size Starship Enterprise? They had it all at Space World. Oh, and the fire damaged geodesic dome. Sorry, I didn't want to forget about that. Okay, it looked just like Epcot. Everything looked just like Epcot years before Epcot was a thing. This is where I used this piece of paper to remember my childhood. Uh, digress a little about my trip to Epcot when I was a kid with my parents in a motorhome. So my dad worked for General Motors, and General Motors had a one of the six or seven uh, like areas in, it was a Tomorrowland or Future World? <laughs> My dad, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Future World, World of Motion, 
Sponsored by GM. Dad works at GM. Guess what dad knows? Dad knows if he flashes his employee badge, which is a power move out in Orlando when we are from Welland, Ontario, Canada, and he flashes it and we get to go in and we get to go up to this place and I get this little lukewarm cup of Coke and I get to look down on the people in the lines and that is all I remember about Epcot. <laughs> I don't remember anything else about Epcot, but that was... Uh, a brainchild of Walt Disney, and this is actually back in 1966 when he died. This was his big thing. He wanted it to be like a planned community, 20,000 people living there. They wanted to put the cars underground and have like public transportation and people walking up on the on the on the normal spot. I mean, he did a lot of terrible things, but that's not bad. Um, <laughs> and then he died, and they kind of mushed it with like a international area where dads can drink beer. And like, it was like, it became something different. But um, Dr. Philip Austin's Space World was, uh, was a lot like this. So, oh, we're not, we're not quite there. Hang on, okay. $40 million for phase one. This was the idea. They got people who had built the Pontiac Superdome, people who had built Six Flags, um, they had been part of Opryland, like they had legitimate people who did feasibility studies about what this would take to make work. Uh, they were gonna break ground. It was, it was gonna be six times the size of the Magic Kingdom, big, very big. Uh, it was gonna open in 1980, but what they needed was they needed some help with sewer lines, they needed help with some roads, uh, and they needed some tax breaks. They needed a lower, uh, property tax rate for 20 years. So they came to Ipsy Township and they said, uh, can, can we work something out? And Ipsy Township said, well, let's get a bunch of people from the public in a small room, uh, 300 people overflowing. Let's have public comment and let's, let's just hash it out. Let's hash this out. And so there were two sides to this grand debate. And I'm gonna start with the, the pro side, 1.3, to 1.86 million visitors per year for the, for the area. That's those out-of-state dollars. Those are out-of-state dollars, people. 1.9 to 2.4 million in year two. That was about equal to how many people go to Cedar Point around that time. 1,000 part-time workers, 400 full-time workers, and they estimated 1.5 additional jobs per Space World job just for hospitality and all the rest. All systems looked like they were go. New Year's Eve, 1977. Dr. Austin, don't know if he drank, but I'm sure sipping, feeling good. New Year's Eve, 1977. Uh, chapter four, space word reality. So they needed sewer, water, and they needed all those things. They held a first public hearing in April of 1978. They pitched the township first. They pitched them on all this stuff. Quote, this is not to be just another amusement park. It's a total entertainment awareness experience, which will show people what space has done for us in the past and what it can do for us in the future. Exhibits, rides, live entertainment, science fiction. I love this one. Futuristically designed shops and restaurants. <laughs> no alcohol. So don't worry about, don't worry. The people at Ipsonani found a problem with that. They said 700 workers are gonna build it. So much money is gonna pile into Ipsy Township. The headlines, Space World Inn for an earthly probe. Plans for $40 million Space World theme park orbiting in a holding pattern while developers brace for what could be searing scrutiny when the project gets down to earth in public hearings next month. As always, Ann Arbor News is like hit, just, just gold from the Ann Arbor News. Standing room only, 300 people. They antis, they leaflet, they leaflet the town beforehand with how bad it's gonna be. Here's what they warn of. 50,000 people coming in every day. 50,000 strangers. Hamburger stands. I don't even need the mic. Pizza restaurant! <laughs> Taco drive-ins! <laughs> Motels! <laughs> not, not inns and suites, motels. Bison theme chicken wing eat. No, wait, that's, uh, that's what uh, we had the Buffalo Wild Wings. Uh, Korean, no, Korean automobile lots. That's an, okay, so they said, you've laid out a very beautiful proposed park, 
But what control will you people have over the surrounding area? I say various money makers will come in once Space World is here, and they will, uh, they will eat up our property values. The quality of life of people living in their area will be destroyed. You'll have destroyed a good place to live, and you won't be able to hire enough policemen to protect the homes from the bums who'll be attracted to Space World. <laughs> Put up your hand if you think Space World is cool. Yeah, bums. You're, you're the bums that they're, these people are talking about. It'll destroy the country environment of Ypsilanti. And then this is my favorite. With factories and business places going up, the farm area of the township is going. I haven't heard a pheasant peep in five years since my place. Five years! Traffic. Sound and light levels, all within acceptable. Everything was acceptable. They didn't have to change I-94. Nothing had to change. They just needed place for poo to go, some extra low roads, and some tax breaks. They said between 13,000 and 19,000 people would come, much lower than 50. Um, Ypsilanti Savings and Bank VP Wally Shurrock, good old Wally, said, 1,100 jobs for the kids? Out-of-state dollars? What do you want instead? Junkyards? Whatever, he was very succinct back then. That was, those were fighting words in 78. They did a second public meeting. 300 plus showed up, 50 comments. Discussion began. It went nowhere. They said, let's put it on the ballot. Let's put it on the August ballot. Well, they didn't have their ducks in a row, so they said, let's put it on the November ballot. And meanwhile, poor, you remember, look at this guy. Where is he? That was him with his family. This guy, he, say, he worked on planes. This guy. He's running out of money, guys. He doesn't, he, he's a clean room Thomas Edison, but he's not, he's not made of money. And so Space World hand delivers a note to the Ypsilanti Township saying, our board of directors has decided to develop Space World Entertainment Center at an alternate location. And Space World flew away to Huron Township. <laughs> It zoomed away, uh, right there, like right south of DTW. So now Austin's like, oh, you don't want it? I'm gonna move it a little bit this way on Google Maps, and we're gonna do it there. So it was on the list of the 60 locations. The people still didn't want it back there. They still didn't want it. Five families sued him uh, for the land, dragged it out in court. Meanwhile, people, he's losing money. He's the, he, it's clean rooms. It's not like electric cars in a space company. It's clean rooms. And so finally they break ground. Uh, in NASA jargon, we have liftoff, said uh, Austin. He was such a nerd. Um, <laughs> this is the item in the Canton Observer about the groundbreaking of the new theme park next to the people. These are Plymouth Fife and Drum Corps who've raised $1,100 to cover their $1,500 to cover their performance fees for the year. They get a picture and this is what space, that's what Space World got press wise for breaking ground. Guess what? It didn't go great. So they dug a couple holes and they ran out of money and Austin went bankrupt. He lost his clean room business he lost his fam, no, I don't think he lost his family. Um, his family, I, I believe, remained intact. But Space World ruined him, it ruined him. Okay, epilogue, okay. This is, it's a little sad. Uh, he rebounded, he's the Thomas Edison of clean rooms, he's gonna rebound. He made a new company called Acorn Industries and uh, I think he's still put it in Livonia. So Acorn Industries, which is run by his son today, not to be confused with Philip P. Austin, he is Philip J. Austin. J, I assume, is junior, middle name, that's a weird middle name, but that might be his middle name. Um, they are the leading suppliers today of uh, ready-to-use sterilized products. And Philip Austin Sr. died in 2021. But on the website, if you want to maybe cry a little, go to the Acorn Industries website, and there is a video about nine minutes long that is called Parting Words. Parting Words. And he's, he, he talks really like emotionally about his family and everything else that is very, very sweet. 
but he doesn't mention Space World once. Not at all. And so uh, I suggest if you Google Space World, look up the M Live story. It's really cool. Lots, lots more like footage and things like that. But this is the history of Space World. Thank you. Rich, ready, ladies and gentlemen, out of this world. He's a star. Thank you so much. All right, folks. That was incredible. That, that story had everything. It had hopes and dreams and clean rooms and monorails that never were. But you know what it didn't have? It didn't have potatoes. And it's the end of the night. I am ready to hear about potatoes. And there's only one person, just one person, who I think is going to be ready to bring this great question here to the Nerd Night crowd. So please join me in welcoming writer, comedian, and the host of the Moth Story Slam, Amir Baghdachi. All right, folks, all right, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, you're all gonna help me kick this thing off properly. I'm gonna have you guys just answer some questions for me, and you're gonna shout the answer that comes to mind. Don't think too hard about it, all right? Let's start very easy practice. Do we love hash browns? Yeah. Of course we do. Okay, now I'm gonna show you some pictures of breakfast potatoes. You're gonna tell me what they are, all right? Just first thing off the top of your head, what are these? Yeah. Absolutely, according to Bon Appetit, these are hash browns. Okay, so what are these? Some disagreement, but according to New York Times, those are home fries. Awesome. Home fries, cubed, separate, hash browns, grated. Awesome. So what are these? These are hash browns, according to Julia Child. Julia Child cannot be wrong. Okay, fine. Let's reset. What are these? Obviously, hash browns. New York Times says they are, right? We got this thing. We've got this. Fine. What are these? Wrong. They are Swiss Rushdie. This is from the Wikipedia page of the Swiss-German dish Rusty. All right, fine. We can get this thing. We can get it together, guys. Remember what we know. There's some shredded stuff that are hash browns. Sometimes the bits are home fries, but let's try this. What are these? Wrong. They are southern fried potatoes. That's, that's what the recipe says. If you Google southern fried potatoes, you will find these. All right, fine. We're a little uncertain where we are. Let's try it again. If these are southern fried potatoes, what are these? A lot of confusion here. These are home fries. Fine, okay, these are home fries. Those are southern fried potatoes. But what are these? American fries. Weird, right? Very, very weird. These are American fries. And I, just to show you, I didn't pick the most left field example here. This is from a, a very basic internet food blog. So basic, I know nothing about it, apart from the fact that the author's name is Aaron. No, no shouts against that. Um, it's uh, the whole family is going to love this delicious recipe, which they're required to say by internet law. And the title of the food blog is The Wooden Skillet. Let's just take that in for a moment. <laughs> the thing that you're putting on fire to cook your food is made of wood. And in the photo is a skillet not made of wood. Nevertheless, these are American fries, right? So that's what American fries are, fine. But what are these? Uh, these are American fries, served at Cheryl's Place. That's on uh, Grand River on Brighton Way. Amazing. Look at the bark on these as well. Look how deep gold. Amazing. Incredible. These are American fries. All right. So, folks, what are these? Now, let's not get, let's, let's not get tricked. Right. What are these? What are... I'm hearing latkes, right? Latkes. They are hash browns. And, of course, these, again, don't be tricked. These are definitely latkes, right. We don't know why, do we? We're not entirely sure where we are. Fine, let's see if we can get grounded on one last example, or one or two. Tater tots, Oh, finally. Do you sense a sense of relief? We know where we are, right? 
These are indeed tater tots. Absolutely, we know these are tater tots. And what are tater tots? We know what they are, because they're like a geometric shape, right? Kind of a geometric prism. They have that nubbly exterior that's uniform and golden. The inside is a kind of translucent to opaque mush. It's not independent. That is what makes a tater tot a tater tot. Hash browns, we know, are not like that. They do not have those individual chunks. They are not rectangular or any kind of geometric prisms. They are not. These are tater tots. Those are hash browns. So what are these? I know. Very disappointing. These are hash browns, and yet they just fit the description of hash browns, we, tater tots, we just gave. So if we had in the audience tonight a stranger, let's say an anthropologist from a faraway civilization that doesn't know ours, they'd make two observations about what they just had seen tonight. They'd say, one, we truly love hash browns, and two, we have no idea what they are. <laughs> we are deeply confused as a people about what these things are. So what we're gonna do tonight is really ask this question, what are hash browns really? And we're gonna try to grapple with it in the most profound way possible under every angle. What are they structurally? What are they culturally? What are they symbolically? Because to understand what a hash brown is, is to know about all of these things, not just one of them. So, raises the question, of course, uh, like they said in the introduction to this whole night, this is a series of talks uh, given by experts on the subject. Why am I qualified to speak about hash browns? I am not at all whatsoever. I, I did have one experience once when I was a newspaper intern for the San Francisco Bay Guardian. They sent me out to every 24-hour restaurant in San Francisco to eat there in a 24-hour period. Was that fun? Absolutely for the first three hours. <laughs> Afterwards, an unremitting hellscape of gastric distress. <laughs> deeply, deeply painful. No one should have to eat that much breakfast anywhere of anything. Absolutely revolting. I'm still haunted by that experience to this day. <laughs> Nevertheless, I don't need to be an expert, because actually, this whole talk is the fact that we are all experts. We know what we mean when we say we love hash browns. We know what the hash browns are. So we're going to leverage our collective intelligence to understand what this thing is. So when we want to understand a thing, what's one of the first things we do? We know there's different kinds of types, different kinds of phenomena. We often classify it. Right? We try to put it in some buckets, some types, very natural reaction to diverse phenomena. And that might lead us to think, OK, hash browns are about potatoes. Let's kind of do the family tree of potato dishes. And one way to break that down, this is just one way, is by the way that the heat comes to the potato. So hash browns are definitely not baked potatoes. They're not really boiled potatoes. They're not roasted potatoes. They do seem like a kind of fried potato, but definitely they are a shallow fry, it seems, primarily, than a deep fry, right? And we get the hash brown here. But watch, this actually doesn't get us anywhere. We are no farther along in understanding what the hash brown is, because once we get in here, this is where the problem starts, right? So we know what the hash browns are in this sense, but we're not closer to understanding what they ought to be. If only there was some outside authority that could just say, we know what hash browns are, and we are declaring it by our authority and our law. And turns out, I was able to identify the moment in time when the United States government decided what hash browns are. It was November 15, 1976, when the USDA rolled out for the first time its agricultural marketing service, the Fruit and Vegetable Division, Process Products Branch, the United States Standards for Grades of Frozen Hash Brown Potatoes. This is an exhaustive text that I recommend you read one night. And you will find nested in there, section 52.6402. The United States government spells out the styles of hash browns definitively, and it says pretty clearly there are three styles. This is America, we're a very big tent here. There is shredded, there is diced, and there is chopped, and down to millimeters, the US government has said, these are what potatoes are. That is incredible, right, that we know these are structures. But notice this, you could look at this all you want, but you'd still miss why we love hash browns and what they are. You wouldn't know what's a good hash brown. 
And often when we're trying to understand what a thing is, the thing we want to explain to people is what is the best version of that thing, right? You want to describe the best one. So let me present to you all what I think, and I think I'm fairly certain I'm correct because I'm just a totally average person with no special expertise, the platonic ideal of hash browns. I think we can agree, no matter what the shape is, this is what we're looking for. A deep gold color, and some of it. Exterior, a crisp bark. Not a thin sheet, a crisp bark that shatters like a thick potato chip, right? Obviously, you're nodding thirstily at this point, right? The interior, there's a duality here. There's an exterior that is crunchy. The ex interior is fluffy, never mushy or waxy. It's got to have the fluff, right? There's got to be these little air pockets in there. And then any trace of uncooked potato should be punishable by exile. This is all true. We know this about hash brown potatoes, right? And these are the things that make us love them so much. When you think about how much we love them, and when you realize our emotions around them, you realize that that structural definition is nowhere good enough. It doesn't actually begin to explain it. In fact, you could spend hours trying to describe what they are scientifically, and you'd never come across the fact that we probably wouldn't eat them for lunch. They are a breakfast food, right? We have feelings about hash browns. So much so that throughout the rest of this talk, I'm going to argue that hash browns actually properly belong to the pantheon of notable browns in American history. <laughs> These browns include, of course, John Brown, abolitionist, <laughs> James Brown, the legend, Buster Brown, weird cartoon character from the 1910s, Marjorie Lee Brown, one of the first African-American women to get a PhD in mathematics. Jackson Brown, the Cleveland Browns, Charlie Brown, Foxy Brown, Pam Greer in 1974, uh, Alton Brown, couldn't forget Alton Brown, Olympia Brown, suffragette and pioneer, great person, and also Foxy Brown number two, also a pioneer. Uh, Margaret Wise Brown, author of Good Night Moon, and her close personal friend, the wrestler, Bad Bad Leroy Brown. <laughs> the match between them was epic. It's truly epic. And then, of course, we, who can forget uh, Brown versus the Board of Education? In fact, the <laughs> there are so many significant Browns in American life. This may be a future Nerd Night talk. You could tell an entire history of our country exclusively in terms of short biographies of people and things named Brown. From Hannah Brown of Plymouth Colony to Hannah Brown, the star of the 15th season of The Bachelorette. <laughs> I am waiting for that to be done. So we tried the structural approach. It didn't get us too far. So what do we do? Let's do what Americans do. When we have a food that we're passionate about, we want to know about what do we do, we try to find what culture did we steal it from so we can feel bad about it and tell each other you're doing it wrong. Right? That is what we do as Americans. That is our right and that is our practice. So where should we start? Well, we want to start probably at the beginning, actually. So potatoes, where do they start? Turns out potatoes began to be cultivated at least 7,000 years ago in Peru and Bolivia. Incredible. 7,000 years. That is extraordinary. And what is even more extraordinary is that in that 7,000 years, Peruvians never once figured out hash browns. <laughs> I don't know how. I don't know what excuse they have. Sure, they're saying, oh, we were busy with Machu Picchu. Not good enough. <laughs> Not good enough. What did you do when it was done? Okay? But they didn't do it. So we all know, we all know this, that Spaniards took the potato and brought it to Europe. So maybe the origins of hash browns are somewhere, makes sense, in Europe somewhere. So what's a European country famous for potatoes? They all eat potatoes all the time? Ireland, exactly. So do the Irish have hash browns? Well, it turns out the Irish do have a thing with grated potato that they fry in butter, often for breakfast. What they do is they take grated potato, so far so good, squeeze the water out, so far so good. Then they add mashed potato. Why? Who knows? <laughs> Terrible idea. Already now we know those two types of potato, already raw and mashed, are cooking at different speeds and times. It's not going to be good. They take the grated potato and the mashed potato, then add flour to it to make it extra gummy and then pour in buttermilk, causing the whole thing to be a sopping mess, never possibly going to be crispy. These give you Irish box tea, which 
you know, may look delicious. Sure, if you're extremely hungry, fine. I understand that. <laughs> you know, things come out of famines, right? <laughs> but one thing that didn't come out of famine clearly was hash browns, because these are not hash browns by any means. So we look at other parts of Europe and think, OK, did they have hash browns? Now, you remember earlier on, I showed you all those pictures. Almost everyone kind of knew those terms before. The one that seemed the outlier was the rushti, right? And sure enough, in Switzerland, there we are, there is this thing, the rushti, uh, this one the Swiss Alps and the German-speaking regions. This is a dense, sometimes plate-sized disc of potato, sometimes an inch thick, very, very crispy. But here's the thing. Rushti are always made with waxy potatoes. And the goal is to have a disciplined disc at the end. Hash browns are many things. They are not disciplined. That is the last thing you want your hash browns to be is disciplined. And also, none of us know what this is. So this clearly can't be the ancestor of the hash brown. So maybe we're thinking, you know, let's think just more broadly. What are some other things that we saw earlier on that could be related to hash browns? What other people in Europe, maybe see the 19th century, 16th century, were making uh, potato pancakes of some kind? Latkes, precisely. Latkes, that seems like a no-brainer, right? The, the grated potato pancake. So that would be a natural ancestor of the hash brown, except that the first latkes were not made of potato. They were made, oh, whoops, sorry about that. They were made of cheese and turnips and chestnuts. So the original latkes actually arise first in documentation in the 16th century, as uh, Jewish people were kicked out um, of Spain and then moved to Italy. And they used cheese at first to make these kinds of cakes. The potato doesn't become part of the latke tradition until the potato takes on in Eastern Europe actually, much, much later in the late 19th century, at which point the potato is already rocking it in the free world. So the latke, while a beautiful dish, is actually not the ancestor of the hash brown. It can't be. It sort of it arrived independently as a way to recreate the other kind of pancake that the latke was. So maybe we're overcomplicating this, though, folks. Maybe there's actually just a country that really is closer to America in a lot of ways that has the hash brown as its true uh, ancestor. And that could very well be England. Of course, the English love breakfast, right? The English have their famous English breakfast. This is an English breakfast. It's got its black pudding. It's got mushrooms for some reason, tomatoes. Why? Uh, bacon that none of us like because it's squidgy. But right there, that is the hash brown in the shape known by Americans as the tri-tater, if you've ever eaten at a cafeteria. <laughs> they actually still are called the tri-tater in the food service industry. So the, if you go to a place serving English breakfast today, you may very often see a hash brown nestled there amongst all the other things. This makes perfect sense. The English love potatoes. They love breakfast. It fits in perfectly here, right? It looks beautiful on this plate. One problem, Britons are insisting one item doesn't belong in the traditional full English. This divisive item has been condemned by campaigners. Look at this woman's absolute distress as she pokes the holes in the grater. Whatever she's describing is a true atrocity. This is the Daily Mirror. Breakfast expert declares that hash browns are not part of traditional full English. In fact, they are not. There is a strong movement against this. These are not original. Who, who are these people? Are they some outlying group? No. They are the English Breakfast Society. <laughs> and they condemn hash browns. What do they say? Somebody had to put their foot down. <laughs> Guys Boul de Missenden, founder of the English Breakfast Society, said regarding his campaign, otherwise we'll find kebab meat in our English breakfast before long. I think we can all agree that is both magnificent and racist in equal measure. I guess what's also cool is that if you didn't know who said this, right, and we all had to just guess the name of who said it, we all on our own would come up with the name Giesbuhl de Missenden. <laughs> just on our own, be like, yeah, no, that's what it is. That's what it's got to be. So <laughs> where's the hash brown come from, folks? It's not from Peru. It's not from Switzerland. It's not from Ireland. It's not from Latkes. It's not from the United Kingdom. That leaves... Us, America, exactly. It's the United States. This is Mulberry Street around 1890. It looks like an awesome place to have a day and catch some sort of disease. Uh, 
Around 1890, folks, is when things kick off. And around 1890, actually 1887 to be precise, that's when there is the first printed attestation of hash browns. In this book, Miss Parlow's Kitchen Companion, a guide for all who would be good housekeepers. And the recipe, this is the actual original recipe. So you can, you can glance at it. One thing you'll notice right away, though, is that she starts by having you make a gravy. Melt butter, fold in the flour, add a cup of stock, then you add the boiled potatoes. Later on in the recipe, you take this mixture, which has been cooked down, and slide it into a different hot buttered pan, fry it crisp, and then fold it over like an omelet. That could very well be delicious. Let's agree that it is not hash browns in any particular way. Nevertheless, not as we know them, but it could be very good, and that is where hash browns start. Now, around that same time, something else starts that fuses with the hash brown in its history. And that is the lunch wagon, or the lunch cart. So lunch wagons are an innovation of around this time. This is from 1910, and actually in Detroit. Lunch wagons were so important because they were a place for working people to get a meal late at night or early in the morning where they didn't have to dress nicely. You could be in your work clothes, coming back from a factory, from whatever you were doing, no pretension get a meal at the lunch wagon. This actually becomes instantly popular with everyone in town, and right away a mythology builds around the lunch wagon. The 1896, this is the Boston Morning Journal, already talking about how everyone goes to the lunch wagon. This is where all classes of men rub elbows within fashionable gentlemen in dress suits. Uh, there's a homeless itinerant calling for a dog with a slap of mustard. Think about how early already there is a mythos built around this kind of lunch counter. And these are what give birth to the original diners, which are often called hash houses early on. So right from the beginning, there's this idea that hash browns are in this kind of place that is accessible to all. Bracket, you know, the actual truth of diners and who can dine there and who's enjoying it. Think about the emotions and the stories we tell about diners, so much so that probably everyone in here who's been to a diner, when we went there, they were already nostalgic. They were already nostalgic by the time we started going to them. Because a huge part of what a diner is is to feel like it belongs to a timeless past where everyone is welcome, where it, there's all sorts of things that are leveled out. And these kinds of virtues, these kind of symbols around the diner, attach themselves to the hash that the diner is slinging those hash browns. So in fact, let's just, let's just do a quick little test. Right? I'm going to, again, do this kind of thing where you shout out the answer here. These are, of course, what are these things again? The answer is, who cares? They're hash browns. It's fine. Who cares? They're hash browns. Whatever. We're big tent here. All right. Are you going to shout out the answer? I'll give you two options. Shout out the answer. Are these humble or fancy? Humble. humble right. Are these simple or sophisticated? Simple. Absolutely. For everyone or for the few? Awesome, right? These are very powerful, virtuous things. We've all decided that that's what these fried potatoes are. I will show you one more. These, wholesome or guilty pleasure? A lot of guilty pleasures in here. Now think, what just happened here? You take a potato and you fry it, but if it's a certain shape and the oil is deeper, they're guilty and sinful. If they're smaller, they're wholesome. When you see that kind of thing happening in a language and a culture, that's when you know that there is myth and symbolism at work behind it. You see, there's actually a lot underneath that that's far more than the chemical description of the thing. So hash browns are wholesome in a way that fries aren't. Although, if we think about them, they're extremely similar. This actually has been the case from the very beginning of the hash brown story. In fact, if you read the Little House on the Prairie books, you may come across this passage. This is from one of the books, By the Shores of Silver Lake. Outdoors was crisp and cold. Sunshine gilded the frosty windows, and everyone was hearty and cheerful. How the travelers did enjoy that breakfast. The biscuits were light and flaky. The fried potatoes were brown and finely hashed. The slices of fat pork were thin and crisp, and gravy was smooth and brown and creamy. Now, just what are the vibes of this alone? They're amazing. They're overwhelmingly wholesome. This is the most wholesome the phrase slices of fat pork have ever been, <laughs> right? But this is what hash browns have done to us and what we have done to hash browns is that we have given them this kind of halo of wholesomeness and wonderfulness, which is great. That's just built in to what a hash brown is. It's into that idea. Now, I want to tell you this. This is the truth. 
I know you're not gonna like it. Most hash browns that you eat are bad. And here's the thing, you all know this. How many times have you got your diner hash browns and they're barely brown, right? That crust is barely anything at all. It's like invisible. They're mushy in the middle. Maybe they're even undercooked in the middle. They're just disgusting. How often have you reached for a condiment to hide the absolute monotony of their tastelessness? Very often. That's because although we believe hash browns are simple and wholesome. They're in fact extremely complicated. And I'm going to just whiz through the science of hash browns. <laughs> uh, not because you can't take it, but because I don't know much more than whizzing through the science of hash browns. Actually, it turns out scientists are still learning a lot about how starch functions in potatoes. These are two ish, uh, pictures of potato cells. Those colored dots are starch granules, okay? There are two processes here you need to know about. They are gelatinization and retrogradation. Don't worry, you'll get these by the, by the time I'm done. So what happens is these, are little, these little starch granules are inside the potato cell, and they're bound up tight. Once you bring them to a temperature, warm them, and you rupture the cell wall, these starch granules flow out, and they want to attach to water, and they swell up. Once that cell swells up, this, this, there's space between the cells, and there's air pockets, essentially, between them. And that is what makes a potato fluffy. So when you make mashed potatoes, if you mash them before they're fully done, they get really dense, right? Now, what happens if you let them boil too long and you mash them? They also get gummy and gluey. That's because you've gelatinized too much starch. Those starch granules mix with water and form a gel, a slime, a goo and they become this oily mass when you fry them. So if you take a good wholesome potato, grate it and fry it, crisp on both sides, it will be beautiful to look at and disgusting in the middle because of gelatinization. What you need to do is actually par cook that potato correctly first. So you boil it gently whole. That creates some gelatinization, but not too much. Then if you take that beautiful potato that's just been perfectly cooked, not too much, not too little, and grate it, you know what then happens? Also mush, also a total disaster, because the starch granules still have water attached to them, and they will fuse back together into mashed potato. What you need to do is take that par-cooked potato and let it cool, first to room temperature, and then chill it, but not below 41 degrees for a protracted amount of time. Because at that point, what's going to happen before that is retrogradation. That free starch that was just hanging out, that was like, woo, I'm free. That's going to lose water molecules and recrystallize. And every piece of potato is going to be surrounded by dehydrated, crystallized starch granules. And that's the stuff that gets crispy. So to make a truly crispy hash brown, you need to cook it the exact right amount and then cool it the exact right amount. If you cool it below 41 degrees, the starches turn to sugars, making the potatoes sweet and oddly discolored. So is your diner using a stopwatch to make your hash browns? The answer is no, which is why they are so often hit or miss. We love them for what they could be, for what we know they could be, for what they sometimes are, but they often aren't. And that is built into the hash brown story. So let's kind of wrap this up a little bit with some observations. First of all, I don't know if you can see this. These are, of course, Waffle House hash browns. You know these very, very well. They're beautiful. They're legendary. If you've had them, you know that they look perfect. You know that actually when you get in them, when you crack them open, they're so crispy on either side. They are almost too perfect. And that's because places like Waffle House use a dehydrated potato product. That dehydration process actually washes all that gummy starch away and creates a perfect hash brown. However, it also washes all the flavor away, which is why places like Waffle House are famous for what? Topping their hash browns, because they know they don't taste good. Similarly, Cracker Barrel, what is the default hash brown? The hash brown casserole, because they know the dirty secret they're keeping behind there, that the hash browns on their own are not that great. Nevertheless, they are all good. All hash browns are marvelous. Because, folks, when we take it all in, what have we known about hash browns? How do we feel about them? These are the things we think. We think that they are simple. We think they're wholesome. We believe that they are inclusive, right? They're for everyone. They're populist. They're comfort food. They're mythical. They are complex. They are diverse, remember? Lots of things can be hash browns. They're all good. They're their own tradition. 
They often fall short of the ideal. Sometimes they're wonderful. They're routinely disappointing, but we love them anyway. When you take a step back and look at the symbolism and the emotions and the myth around hash browns, what are we talking about? We're talking about ourselves. We're talking about America. We're talking about the America we want to be in. And that, folks, is why we love hash browns, because we are saying to ourselves, we love you and we accept you for who you are. That is my talk. I am Mir Baghdachi. <laughs> Oh yeah, questions? I will, <laughs> thank you very much. I will take one or two questions which you know I'm not informed to answer. Any random questions about hash browns? Right in the back, right there. Yeah, your favorite hash browns in the area. My favorite hash browns in the area, I want to be welcome at all restaurants so I will not tell you. <laughs> right there. Have you ever tried British bacon? Have I ever tried British bacon? Yes, it is absolutely terrifying. If you're looking for British bacon, good luck. Because no self-respecting butcher will care yet. Another question about hash browns or the science or the history of them? Any other questions there? Right there in the back. What are your thoughts on frozen hash browns? What are my thoughts on frozen hash browns? They are extremely hard to cook. They make it seem so easy, but in the, the freezing process actually traps a lot of water, which is the enemy of the hash brown. So the picture you're seeing on the front is probably a deep fried hash brown, and it takes a lot of contortion to get that thing crisp enough. So buy them because they look easy and then have them break your heart and be okay with that because that is what life is. <laughs> All right, I think on that note, we'll stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>